Our, our phone master sent calls. Yeah, Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, all of your So the question is, I think, uh, so one, I think not all of our vendors go through the RDC. Um, what is it, Greg, 16 to 20, our big vendors come through the RDC. So the other 600, and we'll, we have another visual here in a second, ship directly to our four distribution centers. So in that scenario where we have a vendor that might be uh, extremely close to a forward distribution center, there's a chance if it's one of the big vendors that they would go through the RDC and it wouldn't make sense if you look at a map saying, why are you driving all the way to Memphis just to drive it back? And it doesn't make sense from a, if you're looking only transportation. But uh, you also have to realize only 16 to 20 or really our 20 to 25 large vendors are going through our regional distribution center and then out to the forward distribution centers. So that scenario, although remote, may may happen that they're driving past the McKesson Forward Distribution Center to go to the RDC, only to be uh, redistributed out to the forward distribution centers. Did that answer your question? So I guess as a follow-up to this question, so is it based on the all the one vendor always goes to RDC, or is it based on the SQ? Like to be some videos they actually send it? it? It's by vendor. Yeah, we we have worked with specific vendors to go into the RDC. Uh, there are reasons we've, we've done that. There are a handful of vendors that do not have interest in doing that, most do. Um, so that's why I say, really, they're the top 25 or 26 largest or manufacturers, you know, 23 of them are in the, the RDC and, and find it very you know, beneficial for them as well as for us. It's a win-win for everyone, otherwise they would not do it as well. So. Uh, no. Do these vendors typically have one manufacturing plant, or a vendor could have? They can have multiple. Uh, great question. They can have multiple uh, locations, and so we order. We will order only place one PO, for example, for multiple products. They have to ship it from multiple locations because they're manufacturing it throughout the, you know the country and throughout different points that, within that they're distributing from. So, so it, it, it's only one PO for us. So we may receive PO part of so PO on day one, and then three days later, we may receive the remainder of that. But we, we understand and know that. What percentage of products that we carry to DC are perishable? Like, are highly time sensitive and have a perishability issue? And how do we account for that in DC operations? Uh, did, did you understand? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. It's perishable. Oh, like yeah, expirable or perishable product? Yeah, yeah two, two answers there. One, if you're talking about the for example, the refrigerator type product, where it's where it's temperature sensitive. Um, basically, you're talking about maybe six to eight percent of our total product is is refrigerated or temperature sensitive. As far as all other products, um, with for example, with their expiration dates, uh, all, all all of our RX product have expiration dates, and probably sixty to seventy percent of the OTC products have expiration dates as well. So we have to have a process where we are able to track all of that. And again, we have a manual process today. That process is actually going to change for us with the new WM system. There is some uh, additional functionality within the WM system from Manhattan that will allow us to, to use uh, or to better manage the, the dating and the expiration dates on, on products. So I'm not real familiar with it right now. I know it's part of the, our WM team, but I know there's some, some changes for us that will be provided. Okay, that's one more question. Can you talk about uh, RFID adoption, especially in the pharma sector and what you're seeing there in the future? You want to take RFID? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I can't, but you go ahead. I don't know. It's, it's not an easy conversation because we could talk about it for several years because there's a lot of different options, but it's really coming down to one is, a, is adoption um, and the other is cost. Um, ideally, the, net, the industry would like to see RFID down to the selling unit 
level, which means you basically got to put an RFD chip in every single bottle. But there's not to a cost point now where that's cost effective, um, mainly for the manufacturers, because they have to really have to start with them. We can adopt it. Actually, we're in the, probably in the capacity now to adopt it today. But the vendors don't want additional costs that they're going to have to pass on. It's going to eventually get passed on, especially with the constraints on on, uh, on healthcare. The uh, the second part of the adoption is um, getting the whole industry <coughs> on the same format and in the same uh, technology um, because everybody's. I'll put it a little simple. They're a little bit you know, um, invested in it because each one's taken their own little uh, avenue, like we've gone our direction on where we need to be. So it's marrying all those up together to get everybody on the same platform. And that's kind of an industry-wide issue. So those are the two big issues that's preventing us from really getting to that point right now. We do have someone that works with the government full-time to try and, you know, help point it in the directions, Greg, related to that will benefit us. but. Uh, we're capable. We have the capabilities to do it today. Um, we have to do something. They, you know, every government, whether it's the federal government, state governments, um, are putting in pedigree requirements around drug enforcement. Um, some have delayed it. California was going to be adopting pedigree. Well, Florida has already adopted it, so we're doing a manual workaround around pedigree for Florida. California had actually put it in to go in place. Um, I believe it was this year. They've now pushed that off another couple of years because they realize that they're not ready to enforce it and the industry is not ready to adopt it. But eventually there's going to be a point in time where they're going to say, you have to do it. And if we have to start adopting that state by state, that's the big concern right now is, you know, we, we can't adopt, you know, 50 different um, um, ways of doing it. So what we work with with Washington, D.C. And the, and the representatives there is trying to come up with a generally accepted policy that everybody can follow and that's what we're really pushing. We're not denying that we need it, we're just pushing a, we need a uniform process for doing it and that's the difficulty. Yeah. On the outbound transportation or distribution process after the FTCs, I think you work with other distributors, couriers or something like that, to do the final delivery? So how does it work? And this is true or how does it work? Like, uh, what is the business model? There? How do you pay them? What who plans what shipments? And please mm -hmm. don't it. Yeah, um, all all of our distribution centers uh, distribute the product to the pharmacies out to our to our customers, the end users, uh, through courier type systems. Whether it's using cross docks with individual carriers, uh, you know, out from the cross dock, or whether it's direct from the distribution center. We all use outside sources for that process. Um, that is managed as part of the TMS system today, um, where all of that payment and so forth is uh, actually being uh, implemented now with the distribution centers through the TMS system. So in the past, it's just been a simple you know, invoicing process where for those distribution centers that have gone live with the outbound process, uh, it's actually using the current Manhattan TMS system to to pay for that process. So it is, overall, it's, it's an outbound courier process with a bidding system and, you know, a lot of other challenges that go in with it. But, uh, you know, in some areas like Atlanta, you know, you got a lot of courier options. When you get into uh, Butte, Montana, you don't have too many options. So 